All right, I'm going to try to do this tutorial in under 15 minutes, so uh, hopefully it'll go a little quicker than usual. Uh, this is a poem Barbie doll by Marge Percy we did in class the other day, and some of you missed it or missed some points, so I thought I'd throw it on the web for you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start off with the title here, Barbie doll. Interesting title. Uh, oops, I better get it back to my inking here. So Barbie doll here, interesting title. Uh, doll, normally associated with uh, females, um, the children, controversial doll. Some people uh, see it as sexist, others see it as innocent. Um, uh, however you look at it, uh, Barbie doll is an unrealistic, uh, the Barbies are unrealistic uh, depictions of females. Um, uh, bizarre, really. And, uh, you know, they don't, they're not, they don't represent body, a, a variety of body types. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, a representative of the racial diversity that we have. And they don't necessarily uh, promote a healthy uh, career choices for for women. The career band tends to be fairly narrow. <clears throat> so the poem itself is a four stanza poem. Each stanza has a particular function that we'll look at. The first stanza here, um, uh, we start off with the word girl child here, and that's a very interesting word. Um, it's spelled incorrectly. Uh, there should be a space between a girl and child, or at the very least a hyphen. <clears throat> What this does is this uh, this shows that her identity, her gender identity, is inexorably linked to her. Uh, it is she is a girl child. She's simply not a child. She's not a person. She's a girl child, and so this will define her, or it may define her for the rest of her life. Her birth itself is very regular. It's a regular birth, uh, which means, in a sense, it's unremarkable. Um, and so, question is: is would any other birth be remarkable if she were perhaps born male uh, would that be remarkable uh, you know and so um, is the fact that uh, she is female in this world uh, seen by others as a disability when it ought not to be the moment after she's born she's given gifts and these gifts she's presented without her consent and without her choosing and many of you uh, saw this as offensive that there was no desire to find out what her dispositions were uh, perhaps she was not inclined to play with dolls or with stoves or irons or lipsticks now what's interesting here is um, uh, the, each of these items is intended to uh, promote um, or at least prepare her for a role that she is expected to fulfill later in life. So the first one is obviously as, as a mother. She is expected to be a mother. Here, this is for domestic servitude and domestic service. And the final one here, lipstick, is for reproduction perhaps or desire that she is to become an object of desire to people um, and that she needs to get prepared for that. Now, make no mistake, I, I, there's, there's no, uh, I'm not judgmental of anybody who chooses to be a mother, obviously, or, or you know, stay at home or any of this stuff, but these sorts of things were, were without her consent put upon her, in a sense, to try to program her to, to fulfill a certain role. And we talked in class a little bit of the suggestive nature of the cherry candy uh, color of the lipstick, the fact that red was a color normally associated with with passion, but um, you know, uh, and and sensuality. So uh, all of these sorts of things are, are being uh, uh, pushed upon her. And what's interesting too is is the words associated, the diction, the childish diction for we and pee pee. Um, Rather than uh, you know, the, the clinical term would be for for pee pee would be urinate, and uh, for lipsticks would be small, and so yet they're not. It, it's it's it, it childish talk has been associated with this. So you can see that she's quite young, but also the fact that perhaps maybe she's being so her 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 identity is being subordinated through the use of language. She's being spoken down to, and we see this with children when adults sometimes talk to children. They'll speak down to them using either a tone or an intonation or even a, a a syntax that sort of infantilizes them. Um, some cultures don't. They simply speak to their children as they would speak to anybody else. Now, what's interesting is later on we'll look at some of the language being used um, that connects to this idea once it's been established. But when you're speaking to an adult with this sort of infantilizing language, it's very dismissive. You know, like if you say to somebody, an adult, you call them sweetie. Um, you know, there's a certain familiarity in that, but there's also a subordination of that person to you. You're you're trying to establish yourself as a dominant person over that that other individual. It's it's very condescending. 
And so uh, rather than speak up or down to anybody, perhaps speaking to someone would be better. Now, here we have in the magic of puberty here, this, this idea of the magic of puberty, uh, this concept of puberty being somehow a magical time. And, um, you know, no, I don't seem to recollect it as being a magical time for me. Um, I don't, I cannot speak for women, but I imagine that uh, it might not be very magical for them either. I think it's a time of uncertainty, of changing, of transition, um, uh, there's a certain sensitivity to that we can be quite affected by the things around us during this formative period in our lives. And so what happens during this formative period to this young girl? A classmate, a single classmate says, T you have a great big nose and fat legs. And so right away, she has a big nose and fat legs. And that, those, those terms are, are, are stitched onto her and they start to define her. They start to define her image, and her image, who she is, her identity is being defined not from the inside out, but rather from the outside in, and by someone else who does not have a license to do this, doesn't have permission to do this. And so in a sense, you know, she's been presented dolls, but she's also been presented an image, an identity, and she didn't ask for that either. We learn a little bit about this young woman after puberty, um, and that she's healthy, that she's intelligent, she's strong, and she's got abundant sexual drive, and she's got abundant manual dexterity. And all of these are very, very positive images, right? These are positive attributes, uh, positive for any human being to have. Uh, we all would hope that we would test healthy, intelligent, be strong, and have good manual dexterity, and ultimately sexual drive, right, for, for um, you being in charge of our own uh, bodies. Now, what happens here is uh, these are all also very masculine uh, attributes, right? And uh, we're going to see this idea of, of of rigid gender or roles and definitions being applied to this young person, um, because the masculine the masculine ones don't seem to fit. Society do, does not see those as being very normal, and uh, yet they, you know, and again, in no way am I judging. Um, I, I, as someone who has more masculine or feminine attributes, I absolutely think that we each uh, have to build our own identities uh, on our own. But what happens to this young lady is that she goes to and fro. She goes, she actually actively moves to and fro, apologizing, almost as if she's looking for forgiveness. And f the question I ask my, is why? Why is she looking for forgiveness? Um, and so, and who does she owe this forgiveness to? Like, um, and what what happens here? Fat legs, a fat nose, thick legs. So big has become fat, fat has become thick, and classmate has transformed into everyone. Right? And the question now again is: uh, Is this a comment that everybody's making, or is this how she perceives herself? Because those words have taken root in her, and in a sense, the word has the, those words. That comment has become like a cancer, um, and is beginning to metastasize. And uh, she's moving around apologizing for who she is. The remedy for this, obviously, uh, according to everyone around her, is that she's advised to, she must play coy and she must come on hardy. And this is an interesting contradiction. Coy is shy, that she must, pl uh, she must uh, be shy, play. And it's interesting, we don't, when we play something, it's not authentic. It's like a character on a stage. She has to present a false self. And she's supposed to come on hearty, come on strong. And that really is, you know, um, how can she be both? You know, uh, this idea of you must be all things to all people. You must always be pleasing people outside of yourself at the whole time, creating a false self. Uh, she's told to exercise, diet, smile, and wheedle. And all of these things tend to be very reminiscent of a beauty pageant. That she is uh, told to put herself on display. That she somehow, her self-worth is in a stitch to how she looks. Well, the result of all of this is that she wears out. She wears out. Uh, she can only take the strain for so long. And like a fan belt, using a simile here, like a fan belt, uh, she's, she's done. It's interesting that the fan belt here again is a very masculine metaphor or a simile here that uh, that she's chosen. The speaker has chosen a fan belt to describe how this young woman has simply worn out and been broken. And there's two ways for a fan belt to be replaced. One is for it to be caught just in time by a mechanic who takes that fan belt and, and replaces it with another one and then disposes of the original fan belt in the trash. And the other one is when that fan belt finally is gone. Uh, it breaks on the road, falls right out of the car. We've seen them on the road, and, and we kick them to the side of the road, and they're simply dismissed, 
right? So either way, she's treated like rubbish, right? Um, uh, like a consumable, right? She's treated like rubbish. And um, uh, this is, I want to come back to consumable later. So remember that one. Now, uh, what does she do as a result of this? She finally gives up and she cuts off her nose and her legs here. Uh, these sorts of things, these two items that were, or these two body parts that were giving her so much trouble, she simply cuts up and she offers them off like a sacrifice. Now the question is, to whom is she sacrificing uh, this, this, uh, these body parts? Like, who, who is she sacrificing her whole self to and becoming something else? <clears throat> and who is worthy of that sacrifice? Now, um, in the end, we're left with the final stanza. And in this one, we, were, we sort of disagreed in class. Some of you suggested that she was dead, she had committed suicide. And others suggested, no, it wasn't a literal suicide, but rather it was, a, it was sort of a metaphorical suicide or symbolic suicide of self, that her old self was finally dead, completely extinguished, um, and a new self had been put had been replaced, or her old self had been replaced with a new self. Um, either way, is, uh, looking at the poem, I think, is equally effective. Um, you know, I certainly don't have a, a, you know, a corner on this this poem. But she is, what's interesting here is that she is on display. I think that's really the key here, is that she is once again on display, just like she was on display with the beauty pageant, or that suggestive language. Um, she's on satin. Now she's finally a thing of worth right? And in the undertaker's casket, um, she has cosmetics painted on much reminiscent that, you know, her way in on her way into the world, she's told to wear lipstick and on her way out, she's told to wear cosmetics. And this, uh, this idea of being on display is the final, final indignity that she must endure. Um, uh, it's, it's a humiliation. She has no control over it, just as she had no control over how she was treated when she came into the world. Um, and also this idea of the putty nose. We had some trouble with the putty nose here. Um, and I've given it some thought. I, I don't have the answer here, but I might be have something, or it might have something to do with the actual display of the casket. So if you look at the casket here, I'm just really quickly sketching in a casket here. And oftentimes what happens is the person is on display here. Um, the bottom of the casket right here is closed while this is open. And so therefore the legs, her, those legs that she had so much anxiety over are covered up. And so they, they didn't fix those, but they did manage to fix her nose, her putty nose. And, um, you know, as if even in death, she wasn't quite good enough. She's drink, uh, or she, sorry, she's dressed in pink and white, two colors that are no, normally say, associated with youth and femininity. Um, but what's interesting here is a nighty. It's not a nightgown. It's not a night shirt. It's not a pajamas. It's a nighty, and it's a very childish word, which again shows the use of childish diction here um, is very reminiscent of pee pee and we. You know, so so she's being she's being infantilized, made into an infant. And how what what does this uh, what does this serve to do? Well, people finally say, doesn't she look pretty? So after all of this, this is what it took. It took her sacrificing her whole life, her whole self, um, even to the point of death. And only then is she finally pretty. Of course, everyone said. Uh, and it's her final indignity. That that's, it's, it's an insult. The last two lines of the poem um, are two... Uh, two sentences. First one is consummation at last. Now this is interesting, this consummation word here. I want you guys to look at that for just a moment. Um, that has, there's a play on words there. The first word, the root of it is to consume. And that means essentially to use up. And she is, in, like the, the fan belt over here, where's it? Fan belt over here. Um, she is something that has been used up. And when it's used up, it's thrown away. The item is, the item has a package. The package is, is thrown away when the insides have been used up. Um, cons cons uh, consumption, consume, was, was uh, the, in the old days, uh, it's not working out here. In the old days, consumption was a, uh, uh, a disease. TB was often used, uh, or TB was often seen as uh, consumption because it looked as if the people were being consumed from the inside out. They were being used up and dissolving in front of people. The other use of the word here is, and this is the really interesting use, I think, is uh, consumption is uh, the the wedding, the honeymoon, the wedding night is often uh, the process of consummation. And what's interesting here is you begin the wedding with a vow, and the vows are public, and then you have the consummation. 
And the, con the, the consummation of the vows, or the fulfillment of the vows, is, is the second part of a two-part ceremony. Uh, for the whole ceremony to be complete, the, vow, or the vows must be cons uh, consummated. If they're not consummated, there is a potential for them to be annulled or, uh, or uh, rewritten and erased. Now, what's interesting here is if her death is that, if this, this is the consummation, um, then what is the vow? And the vow, what is the beginning? And it would be perhaps maybe her birth. Her birth is the beginning of this process, and it leads only to destruction, to being used up, to being consumed. This is her consummation. And in a sense, her wedding bed or marriage bed is this casket. This is, this is what she will be wedded to, death. And in the end, we have a very sarcastic uh, final line verbally ironic to every woman a happy ending that's obviously uh, the speaker intends it to be the opposite of what that is literally uh, it's not a happy ending it's a terrible tragic ending and all of this has been based on all of the outside societal pressures that have been placed on her to f conform to perhaps a traditional uh, or cultural view of uh, uh, the role of woman so there you go. I hope you guys enjoyed this poem. It's a bit more gritty than the poems we've done in the past, but again, uh, you'll have plenty to write about. All right. Thank you.